Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another session with Dental Shadowers. Today, we have an exciting session with Dr. Ptolemy. Dr. Ptolemy, thank you so much for joining. And on that note, the floor is yours. Take away. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for inviting me to your virtual shadowing session. Um, I can't even imagine what it's like right now compared to when I was in dental school or before when I used to be able to go to the dental offices. But this is a really cool way of getting to see a lot of different dentistry in different areas of the country because um, one of the important things to realize is it is very different based off of the demographic that you're serving and the geographic location that you're specifically working in. Um, so with today's presentation, it's going to go just a little bit under an hour and then we'll have some time for questions and answers at the end. Uh, what I plan to review is just my personal experience. Um, I always found it helpful when I was a student to hear how others got to where I want to go. Um, that's also a really good piece of advice that was given to me when I was younger for how to find an appropriate mentor. So finding someone who's doing the things that you want to do is a, an excellent initial strategy. Um, so I'll go over the different kind of paths that I took and uh, relationships that I developed. And then going into more of the life after dental school, so what my life is like right now, uh, current work environment, the types of patients I'm seeing, um, what my goals are, both short-term and long-term. We'll go over some different cases uh, to show you different patients that I've seen over the past year. Going deeper into the importance of your gum health, your periodontal health, in terms of overall body health and the interplay between the two. Also talking about the importance of technology and dentistry, especially as we're advancing more and more and people are having less and less time um, as they're focusing more on their jobs. And then also a few pieces of take-home advice to leave you all with at the end of the presentation. So starting out, um, I went to the University of Maryland School of Dentistry, graduated in 2016. So for those of you that are still looking for dental schools, I always kind of like to probe for University of Maryland because they're the first dental school in the world. Uh, so they were, they've been doing something right if they've been lasting around for this long. Um, I had a great experience there. Uh, they gave me a very solid foundation in terms of clinical skills it was a DDS degree, uh, but what was cool is that the campus is located in downtown Baltimore, uh, where the medical school is, the pharmacy school, the law school, public health, nursing school. So we had a lot of um, interdisciplinary activities. We also would have different professors like from the pharmacy school come over and talk to us during the pharmacology sections. Uh, we'd also have some of the law school professors come over and talk to us about ethics and different legal issues as we got into our fourth year of dental school. Um, so I really enjoyed my, my four years there and I still stay connected with a lot of the faculty at the school. Um, then after I graduated, I moved down to Miami, Florida, and I actually didn't even have my license yet. I still had to take the licensing exam. So I moved down uh, kind of spontaneously without a plan. wouldn't necessarily advise that, but it just goes to show that things will work out. Stay focused, stay determined. Uh, don't let people tell you to kind of go off path. Um, I went through a couple part-time jobs prior to my current position. Um, each of them were, I learned different things about different areas from being in a strict Medicaid office to dealing with underserved populations to being more in a high-end boutique practice. Um, and one of my jobs was even in a mobile unit going around to different drug and alcohol rehabilitation centers in Boca Raton and treating the patients that were currently in therapy there. Um, each of those for different reasons didn't last long-term, most of them being because I didn't feel that the owner or the person who hired me uh, was interested in my, my development and increasing my clinical skills and also patient management skills. Um, so I kept looking around. It's important to kind of figure out when to, when to move on. That's never an easy decision to make, but it's an important one to know your worth and to know your value and what potential you have and when someone might be holding you back. Um, so eventually I found Pacific Dental Services and that's where I've been working now for almost three years. And I've had a really great experience with them. Um, I started out as an associate working in two offices and then I was given the opportunity to be the primary clinician in a new office that opened um, just a mile north of downtown Miami. And over a year of working really hard, then I was given an opportunity to become a partner in the practice. And since then it's continued to grow. So now I have two of my own associates that work with me. 
I have three hygienists. I have two days that a normal surgeon comes, two days where a periodontist comes, five days where an endodontist comes, and have a team of five dental assistants and four front desk people. So the, the team has grown tremendously. You'll see a couple of pictures as we move later on. Um, and I'm also helping to develop some other new owner doctors, so more in a mentorship role helping them understand how to create clinical culture, how to create alignment with their team, how to get like all the pieces of the office moving in sync with one another so that you can really focus on giving the patient the best experience possible and really making sure that all of their needs are being met. Um, so here are some pictures that I wanted to include. Uh, some from my personal life on the left-hand side are my two dogs. So I have two Frenchies. The black one is named Bruce Wayne. Uh, he has huge bat ears, and they've always been really overgrown for his size. And he's about a year and a half old. The white one is Selena. She is about nine months. Um, and as soon as we brought her into his life, it was turned upside down. But they're the best of friends now. They occasionally visit the office and on a Saturday and see some of the patients. Uh, but they're, they're a good kind of distraction from uh, dental life when you get home from work. In the middle panel is uh, on the top, one of the mission trips that I did to Tanzania, Africa. So I led several of those and organized them while I was at University of Maryland. There's a school for physically handicapped children over there that we established a relationship with. And about every six months to a year, we'd go over to the school and spend some time examining each of the students, updating their dental charts, and then also collaborating with a local dental clinic that was in a hospital and that would allow us to do some basic dental care. Uh, our faculty from University of Maryland would come with us and they would do some of the more advanced treatments. Um, one of the interesting things over there is because of where the school is located at the base of Mount Kilimanjaro, which is still an active volcano, there's a very high amount of fluoride in the water. So their teeth, the enamel is very hard and they had very little cavities, but a lot of them had periodontal disease. So that was the primary focus that and also um, infections from different malnourishment resources. The bottom picture was when I graduated from University of Maryland along with my family. I have two younger brothers, um, the one on the far right, he's in healthcare, he's a physician's assistant, and the one to his left uh, works for Under Armour in their philanthropy department. On the right-hand side is another picture from the externship. Um, those were my three closest classmates while we were in dental school, and that was during our fourth year, uh, about two months, I think, before we graduated. So it was a, it was a really fun trip, kind of last hurrah together. And then um, we got to see a lot of the patients that we've been treating for a third year in a row. And then this is a series of pictures that are more current. Uh, mainly from Miami, actually all from Miami. The upper left-hand picture is my first associate, Dr. Sweeney. She's on the right-hand side. And then my first hygienist. Dr. Sweeney's been with me for about a year and a half. And Jay, for the hygienist, has also been with me for about a year and a half. The picture below that is of people that went with me to my MBA program that I did when I moved down to Miami. So I got a master's in business administration, which a lot of people ask, oh, did you think that gave you an advantage in dentistry or being in um, an organized dental industry? And not necessarily, like, I wasn't hired because I had that additional degree, but it did give me a very different way of problem solving and critical thinking. Uh, I also helped develop a lot of the communication skills and needed for developing teams and giving feedback and coaching people. Um, so it, it, it helped me indirectly in a lot of ways, both inside of the office and also in my relationships that I have with friends and my uh, more personal relationships too. The top middle picture, that's um, more of my team. I'd have them over to my apartment about once per month when the office first opened and uh, we would have a meal outside of the office just to get to know each other more, to build more of that team type environment because uh, the success of a dental office is really based off of having everybody working in congruence with one another and understanding how each other think. The picture directly below that was my first set of implants that I placed on my office manager. So it was during the lunch break and we got her numb and then did the three implants and um, and she went back to work after that. So <laughs> she said there was minimal pain, ibuprofen was enough. Um, 
And in the upper right-hand picture, that is more of the uh, doctors that I work with and also business support team. And then the bottom right picture is, again, some more of my dental staff. We usually like coordinate our scrub colors based off of the day. Monday is black because it's Monday. <laughs> um, quick recap of my education. So again, University of Maryland, graduated in 2016. Then after moving to Miami, I enrolled in the master's in business administration program, which was on weekends for about three years. And then for undergrad, I went to Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. My science GPA was higher than my regular GPA. And I, I blame French classes for keeping down my regular GPA, but I made it through, didn't let it stop me. Uh, double majored, one in biochemistry, molecular biology, and then the other major was in biology. My DAT scores, 23 composite score, 22 perceptual ability score. I did a lot of shadowing, especially while in undergrad and in high school. Um, during the summers, that was, that was my main job. I didn't really have a paying job. Eventually I did once I started doing research while in undergrad. But prior to that, I volunteered in the emergency departments of hospitals as a patient transport. I also volunteered at the dental school in their urgent care clinic. Once I was in undergrad, my summer jobs we were usually at Johns Hopkins, where I was involved in a lot of clinical research. And so doing that year after year was a really good way to get involved with research that was actually going to be published. I had a few publications by the time that I was getting ready to apply to dental school. Um, but again, it's just that showing that you're committed, repeatedly going after something and developing those relationships with like the the PI in the labs and also the people who are writing the manuscripts. So seeing how you can get involved and help. Um, and then again, some of the jobs that I had were clinical research. I was also very involved in fitness teaching classes at Equinox before going to dental school and then going to class all day and lab and then maybe teaching an evening class. Also was a tutor uh, for high school students for different math courses and different science courses. Those are good ways to show that uh, you give back because one of the big things that any person who goes into healthcare, whether it be to be a physician, a dentist, a veterinarian, nurse, is that you want to have, have some way of showing that you're giving back to the community because you're going into a service-based industry. So having some history and showing that whether it's volunteering or that you're tutoring or that you're giving back some way into a clinical setting, that's important to show on your resume or your application that you do have a history of that. It's not just something you did right before you started to apply. So advice while in college and undergrad, becoming a well-rounded applicant, your GPA and your DAT scores are important because a lot of schools do have a cutoff where they, if you're below the numbers, unfortunately they won't even look at you, but it's not what will ultimately get you in. It's what they use as their initial, are we going to consider this person or not? And then they look more at who you are and what is important to you. So the best way you can show that is through your actions. We can all say what we're committed to and what's important to us, but your actions speak much more loudly and having a history of action showing that you're committed to volunteering, that you're committed to helping others says leaps and bounds over someone with a 4.0 GPA. Um, so it's important to do the community service, different leadership opportunities, because as a doctor, everybody's going to be looking to you for the decision-making uh, and the direction of where you're going for that day and how you want to manage a patient that might be more complex or that might be unhappy. They're always going to be coming to you as a doctor. So you want to show that you've had some exposure or opportunities to be a leader, rather it be through athletic sports team or through different research opportunities or leading different volunteer events or externship experiences. Also trying to get involved with research. If you can, get a publication out of it. Um, if you can trade off like, okay, if I'm not paid, maybe I get a publication, definitely take the publication. And then always networking and developing relationships with everything that you do. It's important to try to develop at least one or two relationships and check in on them every so often. And always being offer, offering to do something for the other person. So once you transition out of dental school, you have this big amount of student loan debt, at least I did, and you have to figure out how to pay that off. Then you also have to figure out, okay, what type of work environment do I want to be in clinically? Because we're used to being in an academic setting, but the biggest or the best first question to ask yourself is, is there a certain area geographically that you only want to work in? 
based off of where your family lives or a certain city that you have a lot of friends in and you don't want to move, that's the first thing you need to answer is, are you okay with moving or not? And if you're not, then that really narrows down the radius of where you search. If you're open to moving, then you have a lot more options. Neither one is better or worse than the other, but that's an important factor to determine from the very start. And then from there, you need to think about what type of setting do you want to be in? Do you want to be in um, the military or Navy setting, uh, public health setting, academic, private practice, uh, or a dental support, organized dentistry? Um, and then also, do you want to have access to different specialists or do you want to have to rely on referring patients out whenever they need treatment that's more advanced than what a general dentist would best deliver? Um, my approach is to create a comprehensive care environment, meaning the specialists come and they work in the office that I've developed. And so I have relationships with all the specialists. They're doctors that I trust. I know the quality of their work. Uh, I also learn a tremendous amount from them which is another great thing about having that type of model is because you can speak to them directly. I text them all the time, pictures of x-rays, asking for their feedback, uh, getting their input on how to best manage patients with more complex pathologies or uh, different types of infections. So again, military, public health, academic research, private practice, dental support organizations, and then how do you want to practice? Do you want to have those specialists in your office? The location, do you want to be in a city? Do you want to be in an area where there could potentially be multiple other dental offices within a one to two mile radius that you might be competing with? Or are you okay with being in a more rural setting where you're the only practice uh, in maybe a hundred miles that all of the people who live there are going to be coming to? The scope of treatment that you want to offer, do you just want to narrow it down? Or do you want to, again, have the specialist come and reassure the patient that this is the only place you need to go, regardless of the complexity or simplicity of the needs that you have? And then also the patient demographic. Um, do you want to be treating a mainly insurance-based patient population or one that's doing mainly um, paying cash? Or do you want to mix of both? All of that's dependent on what your preferences are. And then business support in terms of do you want to be responsible for creating all of the business elements that make a, a dental office financially healthy? Or do you want some support so that you can primarily focus on treating the patient, managing the patient, and developing the culture of, of the office? And then also the big question is, do you want to go out and work for a couple of years as a general dentist and then specialize? Do you want to specialize right off the bat? Or do you want to stick with general dentistry? I personally knew from the beginning that I wanted to stay in the general dentistry lane because I enjoy a lot of different areas of dentistry from surgery to managing periodontal infections, um, simple root canals, and then also the crown and bridge implants. Um, but I knew from the beginning, I, these are each things that I'm going to have to learn at different rates and certain ones I would start to gravitate more towards than the others. Um, so there's advantages and disadvantages to being specialist versus a general dentist. But again, really understanding what you gravitate towards in your mind and what makes you feel fulfilled at the end of the day. That's what you should really primarily focus on as you're getting out of school, um, because you've invested a lot of time into your education and taken a lot of uh, financial risk and debt uh, in order to get to where you are. So you have to make sure that you're really making decisions that align with what you truly feel inside. So the office, um, based off of its current status, I have the three general dentists full-time, myself and then the two associates, three specialists, the endodontist, periodontist, and oral surgeon, three full-time hygienists, four dental assistants, and now four front office. I need to update that because we just started another one. The office is open six days a week. Uh, and we do split shifts because I have three full time of us now. We can be open from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. So the split shifts means that we have little overlaps of time throughout the day. I'll work from 8 to 3, then one of my associates will work 10 to 5, and then the other associate will work 12 to 7. And then we'll rotate who has which shift from week to week. It gives us a lot of flexibility. Like we, if someone needs to take uh, time off unexpectedly, or they have a family vacation, or some other event, we can help cover each other. So having multiple doctors in one office is something that's always been important to me um, for two reasons. One, this 
the flexibility of scheduling. And two, also, I don't, I personally don't like to be isolated. I like to have someone that I can talk to, to bounce ideas off of, um, just for that camaraderie aspect too, because dentistry is tough. Like there's a lot of emotional energy from the patient that you got to absorb and to have a, a fellow doctor that you can just talk to in person um, really helps to kind of neutralize and dissipate that quickly as opposed to keeping it inside and then not realizing if it's going to come out to someone who's not even involved at the office after you leave. So it's good to have those coping mechanisms too. At the end of your day, for me, it's always been working out or listening to music, doing something active. That's what allows my mind to release any pent up stress or frustration that might have carried over from the day. Uh, and then also for technology, we're all digital. Uh, we have the CAD CAM, Sarah technology for all of the crowns. Uh, any types of impressions are taken digitally and we try to minimize the amount of impression material that's needed. Also have all digital x-rays, the CBCT, 3D x-ray machines, and also digital patient electronic medical records. So we just switched over to Epic, which is originally designed for hospitals. So the, the purpose of that is so that we're able to communicate directly with the patient's primary care physicians or any of their specialists, if it's a diabetic patient or a patient with uh, any type of systemic chronic condition so that we can make sure we're addressing any issues that may be present in the mouth that could be leading to the patient having struggles regulating their blood sugar or finding out the appropriate blood pressure medication. Because um, there's, there's a misconception in a lot of patients that the mouth isn't attached to the rest of the body. So if, if they have gum infection, that there's no way it could impact their ability to stay healthy everywhere else. Or if the rest of their body is unhealthy, that that would somehow also make their gums unhealthy. So part of our job too is to help patients understand and feel educated in the different mechanisms that allow the presentation of oral disease to also impact systemic disease. And I'm going to go more into that later on in the presentation. Daily schedule again with the three split shifts, ultimately getting from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. on Saturdays will be open from 9 to 3. And then five to six days a week, uh, the structure in terms of seeing patients, whenever I start developing a new associate uh, who's working with me, I always start them out very focused, giving them as much time as they need uh, to see new patients, to see patients with pre-planned treatment. So we'll keep them at one column. Then when we have discussions as they're becoming better and more efficient, and once they feel comfortable, then we'll open them to two columns, and eventually the goal is three. So you can see anywhere from or up to probably 15 patients comfortably in one day. It's always a mix of new patients, which we block off for two hours so they can get all their x-rays. We can do the clinical exam, periodontal gum health exam, and then also offer the opportunity for same-day treatment because the patient's already taken time off from work to come there or they found a babysitter for their kids. So we want to try to maximize their time so that they feel like it was well used and they didn't just come to the office to get x-rays, a treatment plan, and then they'll leave and have to schedule again. So having that flexibility and space, square footage within your office is also important because let's say you want to offer same-day treatment and you have space on your schedule the, on the computer, but if you don't have enough rooms to keep patients going along and to make sure that your hygienists have enough space and that any type of patient for a post-op because they need stitches removed from earlier in the week, you always have to make sure those are enough chairs so that all of those different avenues of patient flow can be happening at the same time. So the types of patients that I primarily see, at least in the, the Miami area, is that they're all dealing with some type of infection. So rather it's a gum infection, or periodontal disease or gingivitis, or if it's a toothborne infection, rather it be a small cavity or a cavity that's gotten into the nerve and then it's requiring a root canal, or one that's gotten even more advanced and it's totally killed off the nerve and now it's developing an abscess in the bone. And rather it's either gonna be saved or it needs to be extracted to remove the source of the infection. It's all based off of how long the symptoms have been ignored potentially by the patient and how aggressively it is advancing, um, which again, the systemic impact of any other type of infection in their body can have a direct influence on the speed at which these infections can advance in the mouth. 
So I, I always try to emphasize to patients that every decision that they make from what they eat to how much they sleep to what they do throughout the day, how much water they drink, sun exposure, all those things, every action is either promoting inflammation or it's reducing inflammation. So our body is in a constant kind of battle to try to reduce inflammation, but we can sometimes swing the pendulum more one way than the other based off of what types of foods we're eating, how well we take care of our bodies overall. So it's important to help the patients understand that every action and every decision you make has an impact on all areas of your body. Rather you feel it now or in 10 years, it doesn't matter. It's still going to take a toll on that reserve that you were born with. And if you deplete it too quickly, then at the end of your life when you need it, because you have some other terminal disease and your immune system is totally shot because you ignored your gum infection for 10 years. Those are all things that patients need to become more cognizant of so that they can make more informed decisions. And there is a lot of research that's coming out showing direct links between brain health and gum health, uh, specifically with dementia, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, direct links for heart health and cardiovascular disease. So unregulated gum infection can have direct impact on cardiovascular disease. Diabetes is very interesting because there's if a patient is unable to control their blood sugar, then they tend to have really bad periodontal disease and vice versa. If they have really bad periodontal disease, then regardless of how in tune they are with their medication, they tend to struggle with being able to balance out their blood sugar. For women's health, uh, the, there's a lot of research showing that there's low birth weight pregnancies happening with women who have um, gum infection or toothborne infections and also oral cancer. And so as dentists, I always describe us as primary care providers of the mouth. And so it's important for us, again, to be aligned with the messaging that a patient's getting from their primary care physician that you need to focus on preventative care. And that's the only way to really make sure that you're living as many healthy years as possible and you're able to really live your life to its fullest potential. So being consistent with your cleanings, your six month evaluations, making sure that if you are developing a gum infection, that it's caught early and it's treated appropriately. In order to tailor our treatments more to each of our patients, we've started offering uh, salivary diagnostic testing and oral DNA testing. So basically the summary of what it does is uh, for the patients that are not responsive to the first line treatment when they have gum infection, then we do a salivary test swab to see what type of bacteria are present in their mouth, specifically the bacteria that are known to cause gum infection and then also be linked to other systemic diseases. And then it also tests for different inflammatory molecules to tell if the patient is more vulnerable to inflammation or less vulnerable to inflammation. And getting the data back from these tests can help us as doctors, as dentists, to more specifically tailor the treatment to the patient so that it's more effective than it would, it would be if it's just the same approach for each person. So I think on the next slide, yeah. So again, this is a diagram I like to use with a lot of the patients showing that all of these different mouth bacteria, so the bacteria that are like listed around the brain, those are ones that are primarily found in the mouth. And then those are the ones from the mouth that are specifically associated with brain health or Alzheimer's disease. And then the other ones for cardiovascular disease, those are the five pathogens associated with developing cardiovascular disease that originate from gum infection. Uh, then also intestinal, respiratory, uh, adverse pregnancy outcomes, and then diabetes, insulin resistance. So those bacteria which are originating in the mouth because of poor oral hygiene, then spread throughout the body directly to these different organ systems, whether it be the brain, the heart, intestines, lungs, pancreas, blood sugar control, and then they cause the patient to become more susceptible to those diseases. They become higher risk. So this chart on the lower right-hand side is pretty helpful. So the left-hand column is listing again out all of those bacteria that are present in the mouth that are known to cause periodontal disease. And then it puts a mark underneath each of the systemic conditions that they're directly associated with. So this is a good visual to help patients understand that, wow, this is important. Um, just because you don't feel it doesn't mean that it's not having an impact everywhere else on your body. If, if your arm were bleeding, you would be concerned and you go to the emergency room. Your gums are bleeding and 
you're not concerned. But once you start to show them with a mirror, then they have a little more understanding and it takes time. Some patients, they need to be explained at multiple times or a little resistant at first. Uh, but with time and consistency and consistent messaging from everyone in your office, from the front desk to the assistants, to the specialists, to the doctors and the hygienists, then the patients start to understand that this is real, that it is something that they should prioritize. This is a sample of the results that we would get back from the lab that we send the, the salivary test to. And so it shows the different bacterial loads, the amount of bacteria present in the test uh, for that specific patient. So a good strategy for using this is, again, for a patient that has uncontrolled gum infection, we would take the initial test, get the results back. They would have their uh, gum treatment, which would be a scaling root planing, which is when you go underneath the gums and remove all of the plaque and buildup that's calcified onto the teeth, then rinse it out with an antibiotic irrigation, and then follow that up with laser decontamination to get any remaining bacteria and also helping to initiate a healing response. And then they come back in four to six weeks, either to see the periodontist or in three months to do a, a routine maintenance exam and then a preventative maintenance cleaning. There we would test them again and hopefully be able to show that those bars had decreased. Um, if they haven't, then again, we would refer them to the specialist, the periodontist to get them involved in terms of determining what the next line of treatment is best suited for that patient. Here's an example of what happens when we get the specialists involved uh, when the first line treatment is not successful. So on the left-hand side, non-surgical treatment. So that's a list of the approach that's taken when a patient has a diagnosis of periodontal disease, again, gum infection. And the first step is to do the scaling replaning. Again, that's where they go underneath the gums. Some people call it a deep cleaning. Then from there, using the antibiotic irrigation and the laser, and sometimes localized antibiotics. If the patient comes back and they still have infection, they still have a lot of bleeding, then surgical treatment is indicated. And that's when the specialist steps in and starts to deliver the treatment. So the pictures on the right-hand side, that's what's called osseous surgery. So that's when the patient has had a gum infection that's lasted for so long that it's eaten away at the bone that holds the teeth in place. And it's made these deep pockets so deep around the teeth that the instruments the hygienists use can't reach. So a surgical approach is needed where the gum tissues are opened up like an envelope. And that way there's direct access into those pockets that are unreachable by normal instruments and only reachable by removing the barrier from the outside. So this is a picture of where the gum tissues are reflected. That way the periodontist can have direct access to get out all of the infected particles that are trapped in between the teeth. And then smooth out any of the bone that might have become really jagged and be hard for the patient to keep clean. And then from there, the gum tissues resutured back in place and the patient has some time to heal. It's a, it's a pretty uncomfortable recovery for the patient because um, it's difficult to immobilize anything in the mouth fully and it takes away bone, it recontours teeth. There's, there's a lot of work done. It's kind of like redoing the foundation of your house. It's hard to see from the outside the gain that you got from it. But when you go to resell the house, there's some value to it because the foundation is not solid. So this is kind of like redoing the foundation of the bone that holds the teeth in place. This is a good diagram kind of depicting side by side again of health versus disease. So on the left hand side is the cross section of a tooth. You can see the cross section of the jawbone and the gum tissue. So that little metal object is the, it's called a periodontal probe. It's a ruler that, that the dentist or the hygienist use to measure how much healthy gum tissue there is around the tooth or if it's become infected. So it's testing to see how high that bone is that holds the tooth in place. Because once there's infection and bacteria underneath the gums, it becomes very acidic, that environment. And the bone over time slowly starts to deteriorate or demineralize. And so then you have the picture on the right-hand side where there's a definite difference in the bone height. That's because the infection has been underneath the gums for so long that the bone has started to disintegrate. And so then that causes the metal probe, the metal ruler to give a deeper measurement. So what was healthy at a three millimeter measurement is now infected at a five millimeter measurement. So that those measurements help with the diagnosis of does this patient have healthy gums or do they have gingivitis or do they have periodontal disease, which means bleeding gums with also the loss of bone. 
if the infection becomes too extensive or if uh, a cavity is left alone for too long, then the tooth needs to be removed. And the patient always asks, well, how am I going to fill this space? What am I going to do? I'm going to walk around like this. Um, so you as the doctor are expected to provide them with a solution. And even if you're removing the infection, you're making them healthier, the patients always care about what they look like, their appearance. That's where dentistry is, is very unique compared to other forms of healthcare is while we're helping to cure patients and making them healthy, everything that we do has to be pretty also. And if it's not, the patient will be very unhappy. They don't care how good you were at removing the infection or how good you were at uh, doing the osseous surgery because they had periodontal disease. If it doesn't look good, then they're going to be uh, unhappy and writing a bad Google review. So filling the space, the best way to do that is with implants. And so this is a case that we finished up about three months ago. The patient started out in the upper left with that x-ray. She had two previous root canal treated teeth. The root canals unfortunately became reinfected over time, which is possible. Um, and so the best treatment at that point, it was a cytoma, was to remove the teeth and also do bone grafting at that same time. So that's the second x-ray where the two teeth were removed. I put bone grafting material into the area and then sutured it closed and gave it three months for the bone to heal, the jawbone to heal. After it had fully healed, opened up the gum tissue, placed the two implants, which is the bottom left x-ray gave them another three months to heal. So during that second round of three months, that's where the bone around the implant starts to fuse or integrate with the implants so that they don't move in place. Because the last thing you'd want is when you're putting on that implant crown, that the implant then just starts spinning in the jawbone and falls out. So you want to make sure that it's fully integrated, it's stable, it's strong, uh, and that it will serve the function that the patient needs, which is to be able to properly eat food and smile with confidence. So that upper right-hand picture is uh, the day that we are getting ready to deliver the crowns on the implant. So you can see the two holes through the gum tissue. The gum tissue filled really nicely. Uh, you can see on the right-hand side, the middle picture, the two teeth where the implants with the crowns are put on top. It looks like natural tooth coming right out of the gums. And then the bottom right-hand picture is a, a picture from the palate, the inside of the mouth. So in the end, that whole procedure took a little over six months. Here's some more close-up images of removal of an infected tooth, bone grafting, and then placement of an implant. So we'll start on the upper left-hand side. It was a, a lower molar. We cut the tooth in half because the roots were coming together. They were kind of like an hourglass. So in that case, there's no way you're going to pull it out in one piece. So it's better to section the root, cut the cut the tooth in half from the start, and then pull it out in two pieces. That way you preserve as much of the jawbone as possible. After the tooth was removed, then it's important to fully remove out any residual infection because if there's even the smallest piece of infection left there, it could compromise the implant long term. So you want to make sure it's fully cleaned out. And then from there, the implant is placed in. So it was placed into the bone that was in between the two roots. And then in the space surrounding the implant, we'll put bone grafted material. And then that helps the body reform the bone around the implant also helps uh, support a healthy blood supply because bone will not grow back unless there's a good blood supply to that area. And then it also helps make sure that the gum tissue closes up over top without growing down in to the extraction site. Because as soon as gum tissue lines the pocket where the tooth used to be, then the bone won't grow back in. So the purpose of the bone graft is to prevent gum tissue from growing back in too soon. Yeah, so we talked about this with the patient demographics. So again, the frequency of the procedures, we see a wide range of scope from the implants that I was just showing you on the previous picture, a lot of extractions, tend to see more extractions at the beginning of the week uh, from patients who may have noticed that their tooth was starting to hurt over the weekend, but they might want to have off Monday from work. So they decide to stay the extraction to come in on Monday. There's always a lot of emergency add-ons, which is why we have the option of online booking so patients can go onto the website of the dental office, regardless of the hour of the day or the day of the week, and they can add themselves to the schedule if there's an open time slot. And so that's a good way of making sure that you have access for patients that have last minute emergencies, uh, because even if they go to the hospital, there's not much a hospital can do outside of giving them short-term pain management medications. They're gonna say, go see your dentist. So 
even though we're not in a hospital, you almost have to have similar hours to that for patients that do have dental emergencies. So with that, they also then usually become long-term patients and they'll do anything from restorative work, which is fillings with composite to porcelain fillings or crowns or bridges, uh, extractions, socket preservation, which is the bone grafting, biopsies for patients that have suspicious lesions within their mouth, root canals, which is removing the infected nerve, that's typically done by a specialist. The gum health, once it gets to a point where the first line treatment isn't effective and you need surgical treatment, that's when the periodontist steps in. And then other things that we also offer at the office are Invisalign, Botox fillers, whitening, just the typical cosmetic products that are also used to enhance a smile. The technology that we use daily in the office, the intro oral cameras, and I have pictures of each of these coming up, and those are really important for helping patients understand what's going on. So you can get the picture of each of the teeth. I have my assistants do that when they're taking x-rays. And then that way, when you as the doctor or it's talking to the patient, you can show them specifically from different angles what is going on with their tooth, if there's a fracture, if there's a cavity. Uh, it's also good for documentation when we need to write narratives for insurance companies so that they can understand the reason that, as the doctor, we made the clinical decision that we did. Uh, the CAD CAM, which is the steric technology for implant crowns, traditional crowns, bridges. We also make night guards with it, whitening trays, um, temporary dentures. CVCT, which is the 3D x-ray system, allowing us to see a tremendous amount more of information in terms of infections for patients versus the traditional 2D digital x-rays. Bellscope, which is used for detecting uh, potential risk for oral cancer. It's not diagnostic, but it increases the alertness or sensitivity. The laser, which I alluded to earlier in terms of managing gum health and also the salivary diagnostic testing. So this is a picture of the intraoral camera. And you can see the advantage that it gives you uh, as the clinician when you're trying to talk to your patients, especially for that lower left-hand picture. So this would be a patient that may be having a little bit of sensitivity to cold or when they bite down is because they have that fracture that's developed in their enamel. And then that would be an indication, okay, the metal filling needs to come out, maybe need to consider a crown or another type of porcelain filling. But there's no way the patient would be able to see that just by looking in the mirror. So having the pictures allows us to have a more transparent conversation about what's needed in order to solve the problem or prevent a larger future problem. It's also good for documenting the progression of their gum health, hopefully improving, but also if they kind of fell off the wagon and you didn't see them for a year, you could say, this is where you were and here you are right now. So let's try to get you back to that healthy state. This is the digital CAD CAM technology. The left-hand picture is the, the scanner and prime scan that we use. And then the center picture is the milling unit along with the speed fire oven. So the, the three-dimensional proposal of what the crown should be it can be manipulated then by the doctor. So you can make adjustments based off the patient's bite or the contours or the anatomy, if it's a front tooth or a back tooth. Once you're happy with the design, then it's sent wirelessly to the milling unit. It takes anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes to mill out. And then from there, you put it into the speed fire oven where it goes up to over 400 degrees to become crystallized. And then it becomes very shiny and strong. And then that's when it looks like the actual crown and so we can do that whole process from start to finish with the patient walking out the door with a new crown in about 90 minutes, sometimes two hours if it's a more complex situation. And again, the, it's a huge proponent for same-day dentistry. So it minimizes the patient's time they need to take away from their family, from work. Uh, it also minimizes their risk to just a potentially infective environment. So once the pandemic happened, the same day technology or emphasis on same day treatment became even more important because patients, first of all, didn't want to come to the dental office. And when they did, they didn't want to have to come back. So having the capacity to offer same day treatment was a huge advantage. It was really important. Um, during the pandemic, I had my office open sometimes seven days a week, depending on the need from patients, because a lot of the smaller private practices couldn't afford to stay open. So I had a lot more patients going towards my office. This is the 3D x-ray system, the CVCG. So again, we can see a lot more detail in terms of bone health, bone quality, locations of abscesses. It's also used for 3D implant planning. So you can have 
more confidence in the angulation and depth that you're placing the implant in terms of avoiding sinuses or any other vital structures that are in the bones of the, the face. And then this is the VEL scope for oral cancer screening. So we'll use this on high-risk patients, those that smoke or have a history of oral cancer or depending on any other comorbidities they might have. It's a specialized type of light that will reflect differently off of potentially suspicious cells based off of their mitotic activity, how quickly their DNA is turning over and replicating. So again, it's not diagnostic. We would just use it and say, hey, it looks like there might be something here that we want to have our oral surgeon check out. And a lot of patients are very appreciative that we offer this additional um, tool when doing their initial assessment and continuing care visits. So again, this is another diagram. On the left-hand side, you can see that just to the human eye, there's nothing suspicious about it. But then when you look with the specialized light, there is a lesion on the right-hand side of the palate. And uh, then that can become something that tips off the oral surgeon. Okay, maybe there needs to be a biopsy done. It can be sent for pathology to determine if it's anything that's more serious. And then using the laser technology for the management of gum infection, but it can also be used cosmetically to recontour the gum tissue after a patient may have been in orthodontic treatment for a year or two years and their gum tissues have kind of grown down towards the brackets. Uh, so there's multiple uses for this technology. And then that's towards the end. I think that's right on time. Yeah, about 45 minutes. So what questions do people have? Thank you so much, Dr. Tolman. That was an amazing session. <laughs> Uh, Ethan now is going to read out some questions from the YouTube chat. Sure. All right. So we had one question in the chat. Um, hopefully others can leave some more down below right now. But the first one is, um, can you discuss what advantages or lack thereof your MBA um, gave you in terms of navigating business, uh, navigating the business side of dentistry? Um, so there is, there is a huge business side of dentistry. It's, uh, especially if you're in a, a setting outside of an academic setting. Um, the most important element that I gained from it was uh, kind of like a human resources, people skills side and leadership because a master's in business administration, the essence of it is teaching you how to be an expert in creating a team of experts. You're not expected to be the best at everything, but you need to know how to find the best person at everything. And then create alignment within them and then help them understand the long-term and short-term goals and help them understand their purpose every day in terms of advancing towards that goal. So developing leadership skills, problem solving, different issues that deal with managing staff, employees. Um, I did find it very helpful in that regard. Um, and in terms of critical thinking, this thinking about problems in a different way especially as our economy keeps changing and we have pandemics and other things coming around because we have so much science training as you become a doctor. Thinking in a non-science fashion is definitely helpful, um, becoming more well-rounded in how you approach problems. Uh, the disadvantage would be just more student debt. <laughs> that would be the disadvantage. Outside of that, I loved it. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, it was all other healthcare-related people. It was pharmacists, nurse practitioners, PAs, uh, had a few veterinarians. I was the only dentist, but all um, healthcare providers were in the program. Very cool. So yes, a few more people actually left some questions. Um, the next one is, what would you say is the most important aspect of leading and moderating a private uh, dental practice? The most important uh, element of that is making sure that your team feels appreciated, that everyone is getting paid, um, because all of the or majority of the revenue for the office comes through you as the doctor, but also a lot of the appreciation and gratitude and recognition of your team and how they show up every day and they're there to support you also has to come from you. So you have to wear multiple hats and uh, making sure that making sure that you're aware of each of those and being a selfless leader is very important to being successful long term. Otherwise, it's very easy to accrue expenses and not keep track of things or for different team members to feel like, hey, I don't know why I'm showing up to work anymore. I'm just going to start getting lazy. I'm not going to go above and beyond. I don't really find this important. I don't know why this, why my role is important to making the patient healthy. So reminding them of that 
is an important leadership characteristic to keeping your office moving in the right direction. Definitely, that makes lots of sense. So um, next question is, how much of your practice management did you learn during dental school and how much did you learn after? In dental school, zero. <laughs> and even if I did learn any, it didn't mean anything at that time because I couldn't, I couldn't act on it. A lot of people who go into dentistry versus medicine, the biggest difference is the person who wants to become a dentist, you want to do things to help people with your hands. Um, in medicine, unless you're a surgeon, uh, it's a lot of ordering tests, critical thinking, problem solving. You also have that in dentistry, but the added element in dentistry is that you have to be actively doing it uh, in order to help the patient. So um, the business element of dentistry, we had a little bit of like practice management towards the end of my fourth year, but there was no way for me to execute the information that I was learning. So it was just stuff that was learned for a test. And then after that, it didn't really have much merit to it. Fortunately, once I got to Pacific Dental, um, they were very active in wanting to teach me as much or as little as I was interested in. Nothing was forced on me, but anytime I asked, hey, I want to learn about profit and loss statements, I want to learn about accounting more for a dental office, more about marketing, they were more than happy to bring me into the meetings and so I could learn about it. And then also from the business administration degree. And there's a lot of programs too that tailor it very specifically for dentists and you don't have to have a degree. It doesn't have to be three years. It could be like a couple of weekend long courses, anything. It's always important to keep learning. It doesn't always have to be learning about dentistry or different treatments. It can be learning about communication skills, self-awareness, business. All of those are important elements to being successful uh, as you get into your professional career. Very cool. So um, one person asked, what is your advice for dental school interviews in preparation? I have two interviews coming up next week. Hopefully one of them is University of Maryland. Um, <laughs> but my best piece of advice is to kind of practice your answers to the hard questions that everybody says you're gonna get because you will get one or two of them, uh, but practice them to a level where they feel natural. Uh, if you sound robotic or like you're just trying to remember what to say back, you're not gonna come across as genuine. And the best doctors are the ones who come across as authentic for their patients. So a dental school admissions committee is gonna look for someone who's confident in themselves and is authentic in their expressions and their answers. So I always like, if I can get someone to laugh, uh, whether it's a patient or someone I'm talking to, then I know I was successful at that. So just, even if it means you have to be self-deprecating and make fun of yourself, um, all of those tactics work and just be very honest and genuine. If they're inviting you for an interview, they already like you. That you already met their requirements and everything. They just want to see what your personality is like. So don't be worried about, oh crap, like is this going to be like a make or break thing? It's like they like you, they want to admit you. So if you can just show your real personality and that you are human and approachable, then you pretty much got it. Got it. Um, so one person said, they want to know more about yourself. So maybe something that you do when you're not practicing dentistry. Uh, things that I do. I like to work out or go to the gym. I view it as recess for adults. Um, I was always one of those kids who was like recess was my favorite activity in elementary school and to just go around and play outside and do things. So the gym for me, it's not necessarily doing a class, but it's more like functional training. I love those gyms where they have all different types of equipment and different tools like BOSU balls or ropes or the adult jungle gym type things. So that's always fun for me, doing things outside, being active. Um, I enjoy, since I live in Miami, enjoy going to the beach. I love going to concerts or live music events on the weekends. Um, that's another reason I like this area of the country because there's always some type of music event going on. Um, my family still lives back up in Baltimore. I typically see them about four or five times per year. Um, I also read a lot. Um, I typically get through a book about every one to two weeks, which was a really weird experience after finishing dental school. It's like, wow, I can read what I want. Like, I, I don't have to, you're not telling me what to read and I need to find the, the summary online somewhere because I don't want to read the actual textbook. So yeah, it's, um, I've enjoyed that. And that's also taught me a lot about myself in terms of reflecting and understanding different ways that people look at things because it's not just, I'm, I'm usually the weird one. Everybody else thinks about things the right way. And it's usually I'm thinking about it differently. So 
Um, those are some of the things that I like to do. I play the piano also, um, and I like to cook and do things on the grill. Yeah. I don't like sitting around. It, that's the message. <laughs> awesome. So one more question someone just left down below was, would, uh, does, oh, they asked, um, what does your major and your undergrad matter? And are the prerequisites sufficient to provide your, uh, prove your ability to do well in dental school? Or do you need advanced biology courses? That's a really good question. Um, so the having science majors in undergrad is helpful in terms of when you're in dental school, you'll see the information again, but you don't need to have a science degree to get into dental school. I had several friends who had history degrees or foreign language degrees. Um, they go through all of those basic science again. So those that didn't get to learn it in undergrad now have the opportunity to learn it while they're uh, in dental school. For those of us that learned it already before, you get to hear it a second time and retain that much more information the second round. Um, what was the second part they said? Um, they said, are the prerequisite, prerequisites oh. that you take sufficient to uh, prove your ability to do well in dental school? And then they, yeah, they asked about advanced biology courses. Yeah. Do you need those? So the prereqs like organic chemistry and um, physical chemistry, all of those really like just monster courses, those to show that you could successfully complete those, the reason for that is because the admissions committee wants to have confidence that you will be able to manage the course workload of a dental student. Um, not necessarily that it was organic chemistry or that it was PCHEM or biochem, it's more just that the intensity and the amount of time that needs to be dedicated to it and the resilience and persistence that you need to have as a student, that's, those are the characteristics that are pretty accurately measured by your ability to complete those courses. So yes, they prepare you very well for the course load that you'll feel in dental school. Um, the subject matter isn't as important, but just the, the amount of work that you have to do and the pace. Definitely. So we can squeeze in one last question. Someone asked, uh, do you have any tips for how not to wreck your back and neck when practicing? Yes, I do everything standing. I don't sit down, which goes into the other thing that I don't like to like sit around, but I elevate the patient. I stand up. I wear running shoes. Um, I'm always moving around just because I don't like sitting down. I just, whenever I sit down, I slouch and I just like, I feel gross. Um, so everything that I do, I stand up. I, my posture is much better. My assistants have all started, once they get to know me a little more and they feel more open and can speak to me uh, candidly, they're like, I love assisting standing up. Whenever I have uh, another doctor sometimes come and shadow me and they do work in the office and then they lower the patient down and sit, the patients get, the dental assistant gets so upset. So your posture is really maintained by standing up and then also being physically active, um, rather it's through yoga or strength training uh, doing those things now while you're young and can still build muscle, build flexibility, that will all serve you by leaps and bounds as you get into your older, older years. <laughs> so unfortunately, it looks like that's all the time we have today for questions. Dr. Tomey, thank you so much for such an informative and unique session. And I want to thank all our audience for coming in and, and tuning in today's session as well. You guys can find our quiz on our link tree or our group me. And if you guys have any other questions, you can reach out to Dr. Tomey's Instagram. Let me see. Oh, yeah, there it is. Perfect. Instagram, you can direct message or email me. I love having students come and shadow. Uh, also, too, if you're ever down in the Miami area, I'd love to have you come by the office. Just let me know. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today's session. And I hope you all have a great rest of your night. Thank you.